Good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, this webinar on track and trace. Um, before I introduce the speakers, um, can I just uh, mention how we're going to run this? We're going to do Q&A from the Q&A function. Uh, so if you have a question, please put it on there. And if you like a question, please upvote it, because I'm sure there'll be far more questions than we can answer. Uh, but we will take the most popular. Uh, we will also separately uh, actually read through all the questions and try and come up with uh, a frequently asked questions and answers, which we will uh, put on our K-Hub afterwards. Uh, with that, if I can uh, hand over to Tom Reardon, who is leading the effort on track and trace, and as many of you will know him, is also the Chief Executive of Leeds City Council. Tom. Thanks, James, uh, and uh, morning, everybody. Thanks very much for uh, for dialing into this. And um, I'm just going to run through some slides uh, to try and explain um, the uh, where we've got to on test and trace and how that fits in with uh, with councils and your roles. And really delighted to have the opportunity to speak to uh, a wider group of cabinet members, health and wellbeing board chairs, um, and you know, councillors more generally. I, uh, I would just like to start as well by, by putting out a huge thank you for all the work that you've been doing. Um, it, is, it is and has been making a, a real difference to the overall infection levels going down across the country. And although we all tend to obsess about the, the things that aren't quite right um, and try and put them right, uh, the, the big story in all this is that during the last few weeks the, the infection rates have been going down across the country um, that's due to the the behavior of the general public and the um, you know the, the the way that um, they've they've gone with the um, the policies that have been announced um, in in very very large part obviously there are exceptions to that um, and and the way that's you know been led at a local level has created the conditions for that to happen and and I'll talk about how we've tried to create a foundation of outbreak planning that gives us the uh, the role, the whole place role that um, that can facilitate that and and engage the community locally. But the the big message at the moment is that outbreaks are happening every day, thirty or forty every day. That the public health England and public health teams led by DPHs are getting on top of these outbreaks and dealing with them very efficiently very effectively and um and quietly and it's making a big difference and so um so yeah but first of all a big thank you so i'll just run through through the slides um the the first slide is just a really uh um if we could just go to the next slide please alex thank you um just some some headline messages we um we asked uh, about six weeks ago for um every council um, who was a uh, county or a, a met unitary to to produce a local outbreak plan? Um, we did that at that level because that's where the public health responsibility sits, the statutory responsibilities of the director of public health. Um, but obviously, in two tier areas, we've asked for very close liaison and partnership with uh, district councils who hold responsibilities for environmental health and um, obviously that place element um, at the at the more local level and um and we're really delighted that everybody hit the deadline the very tight deadline from from nothing really in six weeks to uh to to publish some very comprehensive um plans and so that gives us the opportunity to to be able to move forward with a clear structure and a clear way of engaging with the national program um we uh we've had um, positive feedback, thank you, about the additional funding to help with capacity and that was one of the earliest things that I did when I arrived was to say that we needed to help um, put some money behind this if we wanted to make it meaningful. Um, £300 million has been distributed. Um, I, I, people have asked me about next year and I, I'm almost certain that we'll need to repeat that next year. Um, I, I won't be in the national role then but um, I'm making that case already. And whoever succeeds me in uh, in a couple of weeks will um, will make that case as well with 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 James and uh, and the team at the LGA. I'm sure. 
The, um, we've set up a really good advisory board that, that James chairs um, of 11 um, groups of councils who are represented by their leaders and we have a chief execs group as well and that's really really helped us um, both in terms of validating some of the stuff that we wanted to do but also challenging us to get better on the things that I'm sure you'll be asking questions about like data um, like how we can localize some of these national programs um, the uh, the way that we deal with um, what is quite a national system as it's been set up, but we're trying to to localise as much as we can. We've done an assurance survey, so a self-assessment um, of each of the plans that has really helped us identify those areas that need a bit more work, and some of those obviously relate to the the national um, help that's available, but others are you know areas like high-risk workplaces that I'll come on to we um, we want to understand capacity so we we're about to send out a survey to DPHs just to understand what the capacity levels are within local teams we know that um, the last 10 years has had an impact on the amount of um, boots on the ground that we have to do things like uh, public health and environmental health and and often that relies on partnership working, particularly with Public Health England. And so we've got to think about how we get ready for a, uh, another um, increase in infection rates, which is almost certainly going to happen. I think the question is when that will happen. Will it be later in the summer um, or will it be in the winter? Um, and that's the, a lot of planning is going on at the moment about how that might work. And those of you who are health wellbeing chair, board chairs, I think moving to a point where we can have a, a singular approach uh, for dealing with winter and flu and COVID is what we need to aim for. And we're talking to NHS England at a senior level to, to try and achieve that. It's much easier said than done. And we all know that the NHS in all its glory and uh, brilliance um, does tend to operate in more of a um, top-down way than we do in councils and so we've got to drive that integration um, between the national and the local approach not just on COVID now but I think with the NHS in this next stage particularly how we bring in care homes and the care sector to the way that um, that the NHS um, is is supported so that we're not just obviously protecting the NHS in the next phase but we're protecting care homes as well and I think that's something that as a sector we need to prioritise and um, again working with James and the team will be trying to do that. I think it is really one of those opportunities for us to to show what local government does best which is um, take a, a, a very challenging issue and, and run with it and, and engage with local communities and show that local leadership to make it work, to join up in a way that Whitehall just can't. Um, because the way things come together on the ground is is at a local level and a neighbourhood level, and we're the ones who can do that. And um, we've always yearned for a whole place approach from national government. And the outbreak plans were my attempt, really, to encapsulate that and um, take what was really good work that was happening on individual settings with public health teams and extend it to that whole geography. And I think if we can make this work, then we can make a lot of friends in Whitehall with, with ministers and it makes the case that we're making for the, for the funding and for, you know, for, for new, uh, new flexibilities through, through devolution all the more um, compelling if we can do the job that we're doing now and do it even better as we move through this year. And, and I just want to spend today to talk a little bit more about how councillors can and ward members in particular can play their role um, in this community engagement and communications because I, I personally think this is where you know the ward member can really come into their own in giving us a bit of intel about almost where where people are concerned things might be happening whether it's a workplace or a place of worship or a, a local community you know, you're the, you're the early warning system for me um, and uh, we don't use it enough. And this might be another opportunity to sort of make that clearer and give, give ward members a really good proactive role in making this work. Because the data in a lot of cases lags behind 
what we really know is happening on the ground and that insight is what we need to tap into. So if we move to the next slide, thanks Alex. Um, the way we organise ourselves is basically that, that there's NHS test and trace as it's called and there is a testing um, arm to that, there's a tracing arm to that and, and those are those were both set up in a very, uh, very, you know, in very quick time at, at great scale to uh, to deal with um, thousands and thousands of cases and to be able to withstand, you know, another significant spike. So you'll have you'll have seen in the press all the issues about, you know, are we have we employed too many people and, you know, are they uh, sitting idle and and you know what what are we is is the tracing system really really working? And lots of you know lots of um, media spotlight around that. The the reality is that yes, it, of course it can get better, and we're trying to make it better. But three quarters of people who are who who um, get a a test are engaging with the system. Uh, so so you know that's that's not brilliant, but it's it's not bad um and it, and it's pretty good if you look at what's happening around the world you um you then look at how many of those people are con are giving their contacts to us and that's higher again which is closer to um 8 or 9 out of 10 people and so you know the system generally is working but what we want to do is make it better and the, we believe we'll make it better by localizing the bits of it that we can so the testing element is going to um, we're going to try and make about a fifth of that um, deployable locally so that it, it becomes much easier to get testing at a hyper local level and you'll hear from Althea a bit later about some of the brilliant work that's going on in London in that respect um, and, and in, in terms of community engagement the way it links together giving people from groups um, in the community who maybe aren't too um, happy with giving their data across to national government or giving um, you know the, the, their information to even councils you know and 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 let alone let alone government and so government departments and you know uh, you know people being very worried about departments like the home office for example so I think that that bit of the system is 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 set up and it's getting better the bit that we are talking about today is called contain and it um and it's basically about dealing with flare-ups and outbreaks as they happen so it's the sort of third leg of that system that's in place at the moment and and one element is about data and that's called the joint biosecurity council which sounds a very mysterious and grand name it's really trying to bring together the best data that that the um that government has got across different government departments to try and get ahead of the virus in terms of where we know there are lead indicators and we can almost predict where it's going to be flaring up um, but also to, to gather together all the data that Public Health England have got and play it back and localize it in a way that people can can consume and inform decisions in a much more effective way we're a long way off um, that perfect state at the moment but we have improved a lot over the last six weeks and um, and I expect further improvements as well. We then have the what we call the contain team, which is my bit of it. And that is basically bringing together local government partners, um, lo local health protection resources to try and work together with these insights to make the good decisions that are needed on the ground to feed back to inform ministers as well. So if we move on to the next slide, the, um, the the outbreak plans are, are designed to give some added value, you know, to some some benefit, and that's in terms of giving a much better idea about capacity and where it needs to increase to get us ready for the for the late summer or the winter. It brings together all that myriad of, of different stakeholders in a simple way to enable us to work together. Whether that's the public, the employ uh, faith, you know, faith community representatives. Um, the uh, employers in the city or the, the county or the town, um, the uh, Public Health England, the NHS, all those stakeholders working together and if necessary how we scale up. So we need to plan if we do get a spike again, 
how are we going to deal with all these things happening again simultaneously, but not just sort of revert and retreat back to just dealing with outbreaks in, in very few settings, but actually keep this going because it, it's been shown that it can make a difference of um, between um, a, around 0.2 um, or more to the R rate. And that might not sound a lot, but it is a lot. It's the difference often between um, getting above one and staying, staying below. And as you know, if we can do that, then it makes a massive difference to controlling a, a, an increase in infections. So uh, this is critical work. It saves lives. And that's why we're all so interested in it. We want to integrate things together. We want to engage and communicate as much as possible with the local community um, in the way that I've, I've explained. And I, when I've been doing the, the, the Zoom calls with, uh, with very, very senior ministers, um, one of the things that I've been saying to them is from the start was, you know, the, 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 um, the messaging from, from Downing Street and the podium announcements is, is really important and it, it gets, you know, lots of people watch it and they listen to it and, and they take a lot of notice of it. But at times it can seem a bit distant to people. And, and often, you know, if you look at the Ipsos Mori surveys, actually local, um, although we get a lot of flack, um, local government is, is, is probably uh, twice or three times more trusted um, to make difficult decisions than the national government and Whitehall are. So, so you as leaders um, and, you know, um, elected mandated leaders in your communities are, are really, really important in getting that messaging out. And, um, and you know, ward councillors, school, you know, head teachers, um, faith community leaders, we've, we've got to have a really proactive approach to comms and engagement in this next, next phase. So if we go to the next slide, the, there are seven areas to the outbreak plans and they deal with, first of all, those settings that are really of concern where we need an individual plan in place. So obviously health, the hospitals, et cetera, but care homes, um, education settings, schools, um, but colleges as well. Um, universe, those of us with universities in our places, there is gonna be a huge crisscrossing of the country by about 2 million young people um, in September, October, and we're gonna have to have a plan for that and make sure that when that happens, we are really working with the universities and, and FE colleges to make sure that we, um, we, we don't see an exacerbation of any problems, but actually we have systems in place that make sure that that's done in the most um, effective and safe and socially distanced way as possible. The use of bubbles already in schools is actually working in many, many places across the country. And again, a bit of an untold story. And with schools going back in September, as we know, this is all going to be really, really important. So individual um, approaches for those settings. Um, then higher risk workplaces. We found that um, places like food um, production, meat packing factories are, are very uh, risky. And we knew we, we, we put this out in the first guidance actually about six weeks ago that this was going to be anticipated as a problem because we'd seen it happening in Germany and the States and Canada. Um, and so working with our employers the fashion industry, um, you know, there are certain sectors that seem to be a bit more risky. Um, I've got to say often involving low paid work, um, often involving people who are traveling to and from work in um, shared vehicles, maybe living in multiple um, houses of occupation. Um, they are where the real challenges are and that's where we need to uh, work. Um, the uh, testing um, and tracing is something that we, as I say, we're, we're looking at deploying more at a local level. Tracing we want to do, particularly that's been something that James and the team have been pushing us to do. What we're trying to do is, is get these national approaches changed so that we can really do that localised work and get that final mile sorted with those people who don't maybe want to engage with the national system. So that's a bit of work in progress getting the data integrated, helping people who need to self-isolate. This is a big issue, as we all know. With that cohort that I just described, um, it's often as the case that they, they can't afford to, um, to, to, to self-isolate. So 
we uh, we are making representations to the Treasury at the moment about whether we could do more on that again with with the LGA. And then finally, some local boards that we've set up to engage and bring the governance together. So if we go on to the next slide, that should show these. So there are three uh, bits of governance that we've we've um, we, we've built into this system, and they're designed to be as flexible as possible to your local needs. So because I'm in local government, I have been absolutely um, vigilant around doing things that will not work in one place, will work in one place, but not another. So this is a, this is a broad um, structure that should be able to be flexed to your local circumstances. So in terms of public health leadership, the DPH, the Director of Public Health, is responsible for the plan itself and the sign off and that's um, clearly lined up with the, the statutory responsibility and there's a health protection board, a COVID health protection board that's set up to, to be able to do that. That's not a new thing, that's just been adapted from an existing, um, an existing arrangement. In terms of resource deployment, we felt that the emergency planning um, element was the best way to do that and that's the one that Whitehall knows. Um, it links into local resilience forums, but at a local level, you have a local gold structure um, uh, to, to, to be able to, to deploy resources such as mobile testing when needed. And if we got into another um, increased situation, a spike situation, then that would come into its own in terms of managing as we've done in the last few months. But the bit that was missing without with just those two bits was the elected member bit. So we've suggested um, local outbreak control boards. We, we've left it flexible. So some areas have been fine to use the health and wellbeing board for that if you want to. Others have set up bespoke boards. And the, the idea here is that we have an outward facing group that brings stakeholders together and engages and communicates out to the general public about what's happening, where the, where the infection rates are, what we're doing, and gives that local trusted voice that we know that you provide and acts to, as a liaison to ministers as needed, gives some oversight to the local plan. So if we move on to the next slide. Um, the, there is a toolkit for local communication that's gone around that's really, really good. I would, I would endorse it and it's, it's very much trying to adapt to uh, local circumstances. So thinking about the disproportionality issues of the BAME community, um, we've uh, we've tailored into that the ability to, um, you know, video messaging, um, you know, translations into different languages for leaflet drops. Um, a really, really tailored approach is recommended in those communities that really we want to engage with very, very well. Next slide, please. Um, this just sets out that structure that I mentioned in a different way, just showing how it fits with the national level. There is going to be a, a new framework coming out, we hope next week, which will set out the clear decision making um, responsibilities between national and local partners. At the moment, we're using local public health, environmental health um, and health protection legislation to do what's needed if we need to get a setting closed. But we are doing some work with government to look at how we can sharpen up those powers um, and also to show how ministers will want to be involved if it's a a piece of critical national infrastructure, for example. And again, next week, I would hope that we're going to make an announcement about some of those issues. And I'm hoping that it will make sure that you and we have the tools we need to do the job on the ground um, to keep these outbreaks under control. But ministers also have that um, comfort that if, if they feel that things are going wrong and that you know, they need to do things in, the, in a way that, that protects national um, infrastructure then they are able to do that as well lots and lots of work gone on with that and I'm hoping that we can get there soon either next week or the week after hopefully um, and we'll see whether that that happens um, next slide and I'll go to questions soon we've set up a regional structure for the the nine regions um, in England which brings together Public Health England regional directors um, Ex-local authority chief execs who um, are handpicked to be very understanding of you all um, and you know they're brilliant people who've come back from retirement and are really helping us. Myra Gibb in London, Rob Vincent in Yorkshire, um, Jill Stewart um, in the southwest, Gillian Bishop in the, in the northwest for example. Really really good people who are making a difference and are, 
acting as that um, language um, interpreter both ways between the national and the local. And then the, the, the analyst bit, the JBC bit, is going to be built into this, and we want the NHS built in as well. This is not a governance level. It's a support and assurance level, and it's one that I think is going to be a crucial link between national and local government as we move forward. Next slide. We're nearly there. We are going to be producing action cards that should be out in the next couple of weeks. They'll come out in tranches, and they are designed to bring together and codify the guidance that's available already for all these different settings that I mentioned and put it into a sort of pack that you as leaders will understand and be able to uh, work with. And I mentioned the framework that, that should be out soon. And then um, we obviously have sit reps. And if you do get an outbreak, maybe if I finish with this, if we, is, if we go to the next slide, I think we're nearly finished. I'll just finish with Leicester. Um, you know, Leicester has been a real, it, it, Leicester, Leicester was not a, a big spike out of nowhere. It was that everyone was going down and Leicester didn't go down. And so as we were coming to the 4th of July to ease restrictions, we were, ministers were worried about, you know, whether that might set us back if we didn't do something. So it was quite a difficult, as you know, you know, an, an immediate um, work that we had to do to get together with Leicester and Leicestershire to to work together to contain the virus. I would just commend what's going on in Leicester at the moment. The community have responded fantastically well. You know, we're, we're making it work. It, we're learning as we go. It's not always easy, as you know, for national and local to come together, but we're going to, we're going to make it work. We're learning um, and, and we'll get better as we move on in the future. And, um, and, and the virus is going down in Leicester, which is great. And it's going down in other places. Nowhere else is at that level or near that level but as everyone moves down those areas that can't quite make it down and are bubbling around the 30 or 20 uh, uh, rate seven day daily rate per hundred thousand are you know coming onto that list and and we're, we're just trying to work with places like bradford have done been doing some brilliant work on um you know hyper local community engagement work with the faith communities for example um, to really to really make that work and um, and yeah and if you want to organize yourselves on a wider geography a city region basis as Greater Manchester wants to do that's fine in doing that sort of work as well um, and sharing good practice that I think is where I'll finish because I think I'm up against time James so hopefully that's been uh, helpful for people uh Tom, thank you very much. Excellent, uh, as always. Yes, we do have a few questions, but just before we do, just to note for everybody uh, that the slides will be on the K Hub, as will be a recording of this, uh, this webinar, as well as any questions that aren't answered, we will try and do a, a frequently asked questions and answers and put that on the K Hub as well. So I'll, I'll start off with uh, a question which is really about access to testing for those who are less accessible i.e they don't have their own transport they may not have internet access how do we get those to access testing so i think we um we, we've started down this road and we need to, to 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 build on some really really great pilots that have happened um around the that are starting to happen around the country in places like brent and um bradford and and uh north yorkshire um the, the 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 way that i think we do this is is that hyper local approach and utilizing gp surgeries utilizing uh, community um, locations and making sure that we people can walk walk into to, to trusted places where they they can be confident that they'll you know be um be comfortable in the environment and and i think that's where the sort of work that Kevin Fenton has done, um, excellent work on um, the disproportionality issues and his recommendations about the need for culturally sensitive approaches to um, how we work. I think this, this falls right squarely into that category. And um, I, think, I think basically, as I see it, the role now is to, is to expand out that really successful local um, approach that, that's worked in some places across the country. And if you look at places like London, you've got to have, you've got to be able to walk to, um, to get to these testing facilities, and we've got to get to a place where we can, we can do that in a way that's that that you know we get a network of these set up so that people can, 
can be confident in using them. And if we do get into a, a really difficult situation again, um, you know, they can be part of the solution. Thank you. And then a question from Councillor Beckles on um, basically data on ethnicity and the ability to, to target higher risk areas of, uh, of, of urban areas. Yeah, um, that's coming. So uh, it, it's it's basically I've just read the, uh, the 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 submission actually about it, and um, we are improving every week the um, the quality and the granularity and the you know the the informative nature of the the, the data that we're sharing. We're still not there, um, but we've made we've made a lot of progress. Um, but ethnicity data will be coming at a, a very granular granular level and um and that's that's vital i agree to for everybody to be able to do their job on the ground okay and then a question from neil burden about testing of agency workers that are in hospitals and care homes how can we ensure that they're virus free before they start working yeah the, there's a big announcement yesterday actually about um uh, sort of asymptomatic testing and and my experience of um we, we've managed to get, um, we've had some brilliant work done on infection protection control by our care um, team working with our local community health trust in Leeds so that we, we did have a lot of um, care home infections, but we've got them right down. And, and what we've found as we've got them right down is the way that they, when you think you've got it completely sorted, it's the asymptomatic spread that's the problem. And I think, you know, the agency worker issue and the work that went on to try and reduce the number of um, people who were working in more than one care home was 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 really necessary. David Pearson is chairing a national group on social care, and that's looking at this issue, um, and one that you know I I think is been is going to be is going to be picked up in the regular testing of uh, of care home staff. I will make sure that that's covering agency workers. I'm pretty sure it does, but I'll I'll double check that. Thank you. And uh, a couple of questions on uh, these uh, action cards. Uh, when are they going to be available and why are they not available already? Yeah, they, they, um, they, they've been work in progress for a while and um, they, everybody has the guidance that's, that's needed for all the settings at the moment. It's just that it's, it, you've got to go to a particular government website to get it. And, and what we've been saying to, to Whitehall is that we need we need a, a more you know, singular way of accessing that data. And that's what the action cards are designed to do. We, 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 we're getting, it's taken a little bit more time because we've improved the clarity of them and the, um, the, the user friendliness of them. And we need to agree through Whitehall, all these different Whitehall departments. So I would expect them to start coming out in the next couple of weeks. Um, and, and once they do, we'll get a steady tranche of them coming through and they'll help us particularly later in the summer. Um, I've been, my view is that as we're in a big organization, I've tried to say this to, to the civil servants, not, not everyone reads 19 pages of um, guidance. You know, in, in one school or one care home or setting, you'll probably find there's one person who will do that. So, but you've actually got to get everybody on the wavelength of how can I prevent the spread of this virus? What do I need to do um, to, to, to do it? So your teaching assistants, your caretaker, you, um, you know, as well as the other teachers. And that's what I think these will be most useful for. It's that wider cohort of staff where we make it, you know, public health is everyone's business now. And that's how we, uh, how we need to operate. And the action card should help with that. Thanks, Tom. A, a question, I know you've had it before, but for this wider audience, what's preventing the publication of ward district level testing results so that the public are fully aware of the situation in their area? Yeah, this is something that James and I and others have been pressing since I started really. And um, I, again, it's coming. I think the, um, the Secretary of State is, is, understands this issue very much and I think is, um, is, is on our side with this. There, there are good reasons why people have um, have have not immediately just released all the data, which are to do with personal identification. And when you when you release granular data, although in urban areas you won't be able to tell who it is, in some of the rural areas around the country, 
it could just be one dwelling um, that takes up a postcode. So that there are there have been some good reasons for it not coming. There are some not so good reasons, which are to do with the complexity of the different agencies and the different sign-offs needed. But um, we're getting there, and it will happen. And I personally believe it will be quite transformational once we start publishing that data because it will help with behaviours um, and making sure that people do the right thing when there is a, a flare-up. Okay, and then uh, finally a question about uh, gang masters. Are they uh, being engaged in terms of this? Um, I... Uh, I, I would, uh, I, well, I'll take that away, actually. That's, you've got me on that one. I, I, I mean, I think that's the, that, that's the, um, the one where we, we, need to, uh, we need to do more work, so I'll take that away. It, it is work in progress, and it's something that we're doing at the moment, um, but I will double-check that it's happening. All right. Tom, excellent. Uh, as I said, we will take note of those questions and try and do an FAQs. But if I can now move on to Althea Lodrick, who is Chief Executive of Newham, just to uh, talk through the, the work that they're doing and the experience that they've had in Newham, managed to get the cases down to quite a level. Thank you. Thank you very much, James and Tom, and good morning, everyone. I've also joined, I'm joined with my, by my Director of Public Health, who's out of shot, but I will swivel the camera around to him at some point over the course of this uh, presentation. So uh, if I could have the first slide, please. Thank you. So what I'm going to talk to you about briefly this morning is some work we've been doing in Newham to develop and promote and in fact have out there our COVID-19 health champions. Uh, moving to the next slide, to just give you a bit of context about Newham and why this has been so prevalent, so important, so relevant for, for us and our communities. So Newham is a large London borough. We're in the east of London. We are the third largest borough in London with a population of about 363,000 residents and expected to grow to about 445,000 by 2030. We are a wonderfully diverse place. We have 75% of our communities are from black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. And we have over a hundred languages and dialects spoken in Newham. It is densely populated. Uh, there are some long-standing poverty and health inequalities issues. And there are some particular challenges around housing, both in terms of housing shortage and housing overcrowding, all factors which you will be familiar with being uh, of significance in this, in this conversation. That map or that picture that you can see is just to show how the COVID-19 infections affected the entire borough and the yellowy coloured blobs um, have been described as sort of looking a bit like jelly beans, but they show where the, the infection rates were particularly dense. But the point of showing this was to, is to really demonstrate how it affected us across the borough in its entirety. We had a lot of rapid early rising cases in March and early April with an early peak we are the second highest age standardised, we have the second highest age standardised mortality rate. Um, and we, it was very, very, I suppose, alive to our communities when things like the Nightingale Hospital was placed in the borough. Again, reiterating to communities how we were very much at the centre of COVID-19. Uh, there was an excess body storage facility set up in the borough, again, creating concerns and heightened awareness. And we had to do a lot of work and our uh, mayor and members did a lot of work around the community reassurance around that, um, around those, those facts. And we've, uh, it's already been mentioned, the disproportionality issue, the, the Bain mortality data was the source of high anxiety Anxiety. And in fact, albeit all of these things have been described as concerns, one of the things that 
that did was to really mobilise our communities and our Help Newham effort, which was a, a massive effort across the council, partners, the communities to provide that support and shielding was, 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 was phenomenal and, and actually continues. Can we go to the next slide, please? So the second phase pandemic response, it, it start, things became more complicated as we moved from that very early first stage. The sorts of questions that you can see up there on the slides were coming more and more to the fore. We recognised that what I, I suppose the overriding question for us was how do we make a system that's designed for a national response work for our communities? And there were three areas that we were very alive to. It was that access to testing and that's already been spoken about this morning. We are one of those sites for a hyperlocal testing centre where one has been placed in the borough, in the heart of the borough, co-located with one of our health and care centres. Uh, with no advertising or no promotion, those tests were fully booked in the first two days of it being launched. I think just to demonstrate how needed that was and how appreciated that was. For us, we have, a, a, we have communities where at least 50% don't have cars. So having a walk to facility was, was in really important. The issues of digital exclusion and, and other language barriers were really um, up on the agenda. And for us, those were factors that were going through our minds when thinking about how do we best protect our communities, work with and support our communities at, uh, in, in this pandemic and going through this second phase. So the three areas, as I say, we were looking at was testing, information, and how do we bring about the support that um, is needed and help and handhold and support our residents working with our partners through, through this. So moving to the next slide, which is really, I suppose, the introduction to why the COVID-19 health champions. Now, the health champions, the idea and the and the vision for health champions had already been had been muted in, in Newham. Our mayor had spoken about this, was clear that this was something that she wanted to pursue and develop. And this gave the opportunity for that to be done, but to be done with a much with a different lens or through an additional lens, i.e. the COVID-19 lens and it was designed to really build on that that community mobilization that i've referred to already we and i know we're not alone in this we were heartened by and 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 encouraged by the way in which people stepped forward uh, people from all across the communities all across the borough to support each other and to participate in that um, help new support effort and this was the health champions really came on the back of that. And so the why is, is illustrated there in that diagram to create clarity, to, to reach as much and as many of the communities of, of Newham as possible, and to, and to enable that desire that I've referred to, that desire of people to want to, con to, to contribute to, to this and to this agenda. So moving to the next slide. This was the, this is an example, and apologies for being a little bit blurred, of this sort of advert, the flyer that went out. And I used language like flyer because it was digital, it was, it was everywhere, to say to people, do they want to be part of this? Do you want to be, uh, you know, do you, do you live or work in Newham? Want to stop to help, uh, stop, help to stop the spread? Become a COVID-19 health champion. And it really was as simple as that. And people, uh, and I'll go on to talk about the response that we've had to that. So that was how we, we, we drew people in. And the next slide goes on to talk about how it works. And it really is, I think its beauty is in its simplicity. So this, is, this really explains the, 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 the model. It's in multiple languages. The content's very easy to share. So it's videos, JPEGs, there's a WhatsApp group, there are visuals there's information and those are live updates that are sent to the champions in whichever way that they want and in multiple and multiple um, methods. There is also a dedicated website but I'll come on to that. 
Two is to spread the word. So all that's asked of those champions, all those champions need to do is share that information with as many people that they can. So through their family, through friends, through networks, through, through faith communities. And we'll, you'll go on to see an example of there's no age limit on this either. People do it in their own way. People do it, so we've had examples of someone uh, in some people in the groups uh, sharing with every mosque in Newham. And what we're here to do in the council is to support that in any way and whatever way that we can. The third element is that feedback. This is a learning process and it's a two-way process. So it's new. This has only been going now for a few weeks and we're learning as we go on and we will continue to learn. So what we're doing is, you know, it's not just a one-way broadcast, but what we're doing, and we're very keen to get that feedback from our champions of how are they experiencing this? How is it working? What more information do they need? And the point's been raised already the, this morning, the importance of picking up on issues in the community and bringing those eyes and ears for, for us to help to enhance this, this work. So the next slide. <clears throat> So this really shows, again, in, in, in simple terms, how it works. So for champions, they find out about the opportunity and register to become a champion. They receive information at least every three days, and, and it has been more often than that. And then they share it, and it's for them to shape the way that they share that information. There are drop-in sessions every week. There are Zoom calls, it's like WhatsApp groups. And all we do at, with the council and through our public health teams are to develop those messages and produce them and get them out there and that's really as, as, as simple as it is so the next slide and I think the next slide is where is that is, is a really um, important flag and it's already been spoken about if you think about it community champions in a way completely builds on and, and complements the role of elected members. This, as I've already spoken about this being um, the, uh, the, the idea of the Mayor of Newham, but, and championed by the Mayor, but working very closely with the League Member for Health and Adult Social Care and the Health and Wellbeing Board, being right up there at the forefront of this and recognising that this is, this is absolutely a critical role for elected members because as community leaders, these are the things that you they can do and actually a lot of this is what you they do anyway in in undertaking their their role as elected members so that you know, becoming champions themselves and formally becoming champions because in in essence many are champions by by default sharing those materials and being part of that uh, circle of communication and feedback to ensure that we are doing as much as we can in, as, as, in the best way that we can to, to support the communities. So very much uh, a, a member-led a, a member initiative. And actually for Newham, and for Newham specifically and particularly, Newham has a commitment through this administration to a participatory democracy approach. And this speaks to that completely. This is absolutely at the heart of that. Next slide, please. So activity and impact since the launch. So as I say, it's been going a few weeks now. We've already had uh, uh, 200 people registered. In fact, I think the latest figures have just tipped us slightly over that. We've had seven sessions so far. I've talked about champions receiving information in many different ways. That list uh, down that the side of the slide talks about the information that's been being uh, sent out, being compiled and put together. So key areas of questioning has been on these many changes and helping to clarify messages that aren't always easily digestible or accessible around socialising, what the changes uh, in shielding have meant or will mean, in-person worship, all of the areas that we ask our questions about are exactly the areas that our champions have been receiving information about to, to, to take forward and share in their areas. And you can see here some of the um, ways in which our champions are, are undertaking this role. So I won't read everything that you can see in front of you, but school newsletters, you know, putting it in the window, their own um, Facebook and other type groups share. So again, it's the, the key is to have the information as shareable as possible with as little, as few rules about how that is done 
the important thing is just to make it work. Next slide, please. And, and this is some examples of the materials. And I, I mentioned the languages. So these materials are produced in a number of, of our community languages. They very visual, very much based on infographics, very easily digestible, and most importantly, very easy to pass on. And this is a, a, an example from the dedicated web page, which you can see at the bottom of that middle column. And we will be loading these materials so you can access that page yourselves if you, if you would wish to look at that in a bit more detail and understand a bit more about it. Next slide, please. And I was really keen to, I appreciate that we haven't got an enormous, huge amount of time, so but I just really want to leave this up for a minute, just to see the range of champions. And you'll probably have been drawn as I was to Adian, who is recently turned seven, and he is one of our community champions. He got involved with his mother. He wants to be a champion, and you can see what he says. He thought it'd be a very good opportunity to gain more knowledge and share it with everyone at his school. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really impressed. I wish, I wish when my daughter was seven, she would have been as able as Adjian is, or even now. Um, and other examples. I mean, great community representatives who are in their own ways through church, through families and friends, just are taking up the opportunity of, of participating in, in keeping. Newham's communities in forms and, and thereby keeping them safe and I know we don't have the time to go through all of these in detail this morning but it would be I think if you can access this afterwards it'd be great just to to read those those stories through. Next slide please. So this so what next? We're continuing to recruit champions we're continuing to build awareness and that sense of connection through continuing to build the, this, this network. And it's something that we're doing because we've, we've, we've accelerated because of COVID, but this is something that we will continue to do. One of the issues for a community like Newham are those issues of health inequalities that come from poverty, as we all know. And this isn't something that we want to just pick up and drop again when, and you know, and hopeful when we are out of this. This is very much the approach we want to take going forward. But for now, we will continue to develop um, spoken word options for people with visual impairment, continue to develop materials in different languages. And I think most, most importantly, is continuing to learn and improve from the feedback that we're getting from those champions and their experience of doing this in our communities. And that is the end. Thank you. Althea, thank you very much indeed. And I think that that community health champion is a really interesting thing for, for us all to look at. Um, I have a few questions, there may be a few overlaps with, uh, with Tom. But if we start on particularly looking at Newham as an example, how, uh, this is from Elizabeth Daly. How can we improve support and regular contact for those hard to reach groups? Uh, such as the elderly and others who, who don't have physical access to testing. Okay, should I, in fact, so I know Jason is sitting in your itching to come in, so hang on. Right. There you go. Hi, Jason. Hi there, so uh, I'll, I'll say something on that. I mean, I think that's a massive, that's such an important challenge, and I think it is about how we build on that community mobilization through the first wave of the pandemic and work in a, in a real collaboration between local authority services, NHS and our voluntary sector to make sure that we've got those systems in place to proactively reach out to people who have barriers to, um, barriers to access, accessing testing, contact tracing and vitally the support that's necessary. So just this week we've launched uh, a, a new, we're piloting, which we will pilot and learn from a new voluntary sector support service that we're publicising to all of our residents, um, where if they need support to access testing or contact tracing or some support to self-isolate, they can get that support through that service. And, 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 and it's about, I think, those different bits of the system all working, all working in tandem. Thank you. Um, just looking again, and, and particularly for the Newham or London examples, 
Uh, thinking, and this is from David Whip. Uh, thinking about high-risk workplaces, are there examples of workplace testing taking place? So we uh, we've just part of as it was announced by ministers over the last couple of days. We just we're part of a national pilot of asymptomatic testing of workers uh, in some high-risk places, and we're for us locally in Newham. That's happening through our hyperlocal testing pilot, um, and I think that is going to my understanding, and, and Tom will probably know more. That's going to be expanding quite significantly um, going forward. Uh, Tom, if you wanted to comment on that, yeah, no, that's right. I, th I think the next phase is all about the, as I said before about um, this, the it's about how do we how do we learn. Usually, with pilots in in the sector and, the, and national policy, we we, we have you know, too many pilots that don't end up mainstreamed. And I think that's another thing with this um, piece of work where let's let's make sure that doesn't happen here. Let's, you know, the, the good practice like we've seen um, from, from Newham and, and other London boroughs, I think has got to be um, expanded across the country. And I think that's starting to happen. We've got a new team actually in testing who are very intent on making that happen. So um, yeah, it, it's it's the direction that we're we're now set on, and I expect it to to continue. Tom, thanks. Uh, I know certainly speaking to you and, and government ministers, there is a big concern about flu. So if I take Louise Jackson's question, given the cultural sensitive approaches, will a non-porcine flu vaccination be provided by the NHS so we don't have a nightmare of flu and COVID? outbreak in vulnerable populations. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering whether my DPH colleague um, in Newham might want to want to answer that. But I, I, I mean, I, I think this is the, the point I was making about um, if we don't integrate um, our work, then we're going to get the situation where, you know, we've got, you know, if you think about, about what, how much fear there is out there because of what's happened, it's going to be very interesting about the reactions to vaccine, you know, for flu, and then, you know, hopefully we get the vaccine for for COVID. Um, and managing that at a community basis is going to be massively important. And so, I, I think the principle of of making sure we're working together between the NHS and and local government through the the DPH role is is crucial. But. Uh, colleague in you might want to comment more I don't know I mean I, I, I can't I don't know what, where things are in terms of specific vaccine um, development but the bit that I do know about is how uh, actually amazing our faith communities have been in engaging with us through this whole process and I think um, the one one thing we can absolutely do at a local level building on what Tom said is working closely continuing to work really really closely because uh, you know, it's an area of massive importance to our local residents. It's an area, um, I don't know if people have seen going around, there's a, there's a, there's a quite good infographic that's, start, that's been developed by a group of epidemiologists and, and scientists around that categorises risk of different kinds of activities from kind of low risk to high risk activities. And, and right at the, the end of high risk is communal indoor prayer. And I think, you know, that's a massive issue for many of our faith community. So I think we have to, you know, whether it's on vaccine or prayer, we have to keep working really hand in hand and closely and engaging. And the, and the champions model is just one example of, of different ways in which we need to continue doing that. Sorry, I just, I, I did, um, I should have said as well on the, on just for continuing that point. I, in Bradford, we've been, um, the, the piloting outdoor prayer as a, as, a, as an approach, for example, to, to, to address that issue. And I think the culturally sensitive point that's been made in the question, sorry, I didn't pick up in, the, in, in my first answer, is absolutely vital that we get that right. And we've got to adapt that through the, the, local, um, the, you know, the local way that we work with the NHS and ourselves moving forward, definitely. Right. And I think quite an important question here from Sinead Mooney on... Can you confirm what constitutes a high-risk workplace? Uh, Tom, if you want to start off with that. 
I, I think I don't think you can have a hard and fast definition. To be honest, I think it. Uh, I think there are certain industries, the, the meatpacking one, because of the the temperature at which people are working, because of the um, the 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 fact that if it's loud, people will even if they're wearing PPE, they might shout um, at times. The, um, the 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 work the nature of the the workforce and how they how they get to work and where they live is is all linked together so that there are there are sectors that are appearing that are higher risk um, but there are it, it, it isn't uh, necessarily a definition that you if you're in the food industry then you you're higher risk than someone who isn't um, uh, we're learning as we go on this and I think it's um, that's why the local approach matters because I think locally people will know, you know, where, where those, you know, um, maybe the practices aren't as strong as they need to be and make sure that they work with the HSE locally to, to identify those workplaces and, um, and, and, and work with them to make sure that they're, 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 that risk is mitigated. And so that's where the local approach comes into its own for me. That's good. Uh, then I think we've just got one question which is from is it about Seacom. Um, it's important in hospitals to reduce down patient movement. How can this message be landed? <clears throat> Sorry Tom, I'm not sure. Did you hear that one? I think I got the the end of it I, about hospital movements. Um, is that right? Hello. Yes. Sorry. It, it, it's just yes. Yeah. What was normal for sort of hospital movements, etc., pre-COVID? COVID. Yeah, I, I think I think the uh, the hospitals are all reviewing their practices, and I think particularly the issue of um, discharge is the one that we're going to have to work very very carefully on, and make sure that we have um, a situation where we know that care homes can be confident that people who are coming out of hospital um, don't have COVID, and um, that that I I hope will be one of the big legacies of this first phase that we get right in the second phase. Um, the, the movements within hospitals as well so that we are um, isolating the virus if it happens is also really important and you know use of use of PPE um, there's got to be parity of esteem for me between social care and the NHS in terms of uh, the PPE supply through this next phase as well which many of us have been saying right from the start of this virus. I don't know whether we've lost the connection to James, so um, I'm just looking at um, the questions and there's one about temperature testing. Maybe if I finish off with that one. Um, I, I don't know of any plans at the moment by government to fund temperature testing for schools and for places of worship, but um, I think that's where um, you know, obviously, as we as we move forward and as we as we go further on, we will uh, continue to to look at issues like that and see if we can, um, you know, we can make sure that they they are fed in and we um, we deal with those as we as we can. I think we were up in in time and we've lost James, so I was going to suggest that we probably finish unless Althea wants to say anything in finishing. No, that's fine. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, uh, just to thank um, Althea uh, and um, colleagues from, from Newham, um, to thank James and the LGA and all of you for tuning in. I would just say one thing in finishing. The LGA have been absolutely brilliant in supporting me in my role, um, along with um, an, a fantastic member of staff I've got, my Chief of Staff, Mariana Paxton. Um, and we've worked really, really well together to, and been supported incredibly well by, by James, Mark Lloyd and the team. And, um, you know, I just wanted to thank them for, for the role that they've played as well. Um, and thank you for listening. And hopefully uh, we'll, we'll uh, be able to 
uh, do it again soon. Thank you.